Welcome to the Health with Hashimoto's podcast. This is where exhausted women with Hashimoto's discover a true, simple, and sustainable path to whole health. And this week is Sleep Awareness Week, which is from March 12th to 18th. I guess it happens every single year after daylight savings time in the United States. I did not know that Sleep Awareness Week was happening when I planned this uh, podcast episode to talk about sleep. I did talk about sleep in episode 23, and I covered a lot of information in there, including a ton of tips. So today is not going to be so many tips as we're going to be looking at how people say they sleep in general and what you can do about it. I'm going to be reviewing one of the graphs on the National Sleep Foundation's results that they publish in preparation for this week. And they asked people things like, do you have a consistent wake up time? How much time do you sleep? Do you have a sleep promoting environment? A lot of things that we chatted about back in episode 23. Again, in that episode, I gave you a lot of tips on how to sleep better. This survey seems to be looking at, are people implementing these tips? The survey itself was done by the National Sleep Foundation. They surveyed a little over a thousand people and their main focus is on how does your sleep affect your mental health. It is a pretty interesting study and I will have the link so that you can down the P- you can download the PDF if you want. It'll be in the show notes and on my page on the website where, you know, I give you the transcript and all of the links. So if you had to guess, how would you think that people answered these questions? Now, keep in mind, it was a population of over a thousand people and it was in the United States, but I'm assuming that most countries where my listeners, you are from, would be about the same. So these were the things they asked. Do you have a consistent wake up time? Do you have a consistent bedtime? Do you allow seven to nine hours for sleep? Do you have a sleep promoting environment? Do you use electronic devices before bed? Do you do relaxing activities before sleep? Do you avoid substances before bed? Are your meals at consistent times? Do you have moderate to vigorous activity during the day? And are you exposed to bright light? I'm assuming that's bright light in the morning. Now, of course, I do not have the exact questions that they asked. I just have their results. So how did you do on those? I'm curious. Go ahead over to Instagram. And take a screenshot of the podcast right now, share it to your stories, and tell me, um, You of course, tag me at esthery.rn on Instagram. Tag me and tell me how you sleep. How do you do on these different things? So let's go over it. Let's do worst to best. Which one do you struggle with most? Well, most of the respondents struggled the most with being on electronic devices before bed. In fact, only 15% of them answered that they did well with that. So their results were given in a number or a letter grade. And so green was an A, and that was only 15%. 76% of their respondents got an F. That's really bad. Um, and then 6% got a C and 3% got a B. And this is really important because for one thing, when you are on a device that emits blue light, it interferes with your melatonin production and your quality of sleep. I know there's a lot of people, maybe you included, who are like, no, Esther, I can fall asleep while holding my phone. In fact, sometimes I drop it on my face. So obviously the best thing is to not have your phone in bed, but if you are going to have your phone in bed, get a loopy case. It's got a little loop, of course, for your finger, and it stops the drop. It stops you from dropping it on your face, which is great. Um, But of course, the best thing to do is to limit blue light exposure before bed because your melatonin is the hormone that you need in order to sleep well. So you might be able to fall asleep, but your quality of sleep is not going to be great. And depending on what you are watching or reading or consuming before you fall asleep, that is going to interfere with your sleep as well. Being on social media and watching movies that spike your adrenaline, those are going to interfere with your sleep because it all increases your stress response. And I know you might think that watching a movie is relaxing. Your brain and your hormones respond as if you're in the movie. So it might be 
comfortable. It might be a nice routine. You might enjoy it. But as far as a physiologic hormone reaction, watching something stressful or scrolling social media and comparing yourself and, um, you know, just all the research that tells us that social media raises our stress level, that interferes with a quality night sleep. So 76% of respondents got an F in this category. And then, you know, another nine were not optimal. So how do you do on that? When we're going through a Hashimoto's health session, when somebody hires me to do that, and we sit on Zoom, and we look at the whole picture, we look at everything that's going on, we pick one thing that's generally your biggest area of improvement. And we try to figure out together one thing, one simple thing that you can do to change your overall health. Because to change the whole picture, you don't have to change huge things. It's often simple changes that are rather small that make the biggest impact because you can maintain that change. So look at your electronic devices before bed and figure out, can you do something different? Can you put on blue blocker, amber colored glasses at the minimum? Can you set a timer on your phone or a, a bedtime alarm and turn it off? But the main thing is to figure out what's going to work for you because interfering with your melatonin production, interfering with the quality of your sleep all night long, that has a huge huge impact on your mental health, on your physical health. It impacts your immune system. Kids who are on blue light before bed, it interferes with their period of time where they're growing. It just interferes with a lot of stuff. So if you can do one thing, personally, I would pick that one because we know a lot of people struggle with it. And it's one thing that you could change that impacts your entire life. So the next worst category would be moderate to vigorous activity. So how about you? Do you get exercise during the day? Do you work out or move your body enough to sweat during the day? That's kind of my threshold for moderate activity. Did I break a sweat? I would call that moderate. And of course, when you're doing moderate activity and exercise in the morning, it helps your body to get better sleep at night. And the next category is the opposite of that. So 59% of people got a failing grade in moderate to vigorous activity. And then you move up to 46% of people got an F or failing grade in relaxing activities before sleep. And here is why setting a bedtime alarm on your phone can be so helpful. You can use that bedtime alarm to trigger a routine stack of yours. So a routine stack would be, you know, when this alarm is going to go off, it's not quite a habit, but you have a routine that you're going to do. When the bedtime alarm goes off, I am going to fill my water for the next day. That's something that I personally do. I stand at the fridge. It takes me about 120 seconds, depending on how clean my filter is, to fill my water for the next day. So I do that, make sure that the dishwasher is running, and then I head upstairs. And from there, then you do the things that, you know, you normally do to get ready for bed, whether it's brushing your teeth, doing a skincare routine, do you put essential oils diffusing in your room, then get out a book or, you know, have some time with your spouse or significant other, figure out what it is for you that's going to be relaxing to help you move into sleep. Because we do not want to go to sleep stressed. We do not want to go to sleep increasing our cortisol hormone, which is our stress hormone. I have talked before on this podcast about the power of journaling, especially gratitude journaling. If you can incorporate that into your relaxing activities before sleep, you don't just do a one line summary of the day or three to five things that you are grateful for during the day. That has a huge impact on your emotional health, your mental health, your physical health even, and your spiritual health. It impacts everything. Gratitude journaling is very powerful. And if you can incorporate that into your routines in the evening before you go to sleep, you're going to sleep better. All right, moving on. Now I'm just going to start at the top of the graph of the chart and move down. We're not going to rank them anymore. 
So a consistent wake up time and a consistent bedtime were both scored. And these actually people do really well. 47% and 51% get A's in this. I'm sure that, you know, having a job and getting kids out the door to school plays a huge role in this because we have to wake up at a, at a set time. And then also we have to go to bed at a set time. So people do really well with that. I hope you do too. And when you're setting your wake up time and your bedtime, do you allow for seven to nine hours of sleep? Most people do. 46% of the people got an A, 7% got a B, and then, you know, the rest did not. <laughs> if you do not get enough sleep, it's something that you get to work on and you probably know it about yourself. I know that when I was struggling so badly on going to bed, I knew it. I was 100% aware that the clock was creeping up. In fact, one of my um, friends, her family lived with us um, when I was a teenager. They lived with us for a little over a year, and she still will bring up occasionally the fact that I would turn my back to my alarm clock so that I wouldn't know what time it was, so that I could just keep reading until I finally got tired enough to go to sleep. Um, obviously, that's not a great recipe for getting a good night's sleep of just reading until one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was fully aware that I was not getting seven to nine hours of sleep. And if that's something that you struggle with, you probably are aware of that too. Sometimes it's not that you're not allowing time for sleep. It's just that you try to go to sleep and it doesn't work. And then go back to episode 23, where I give you a lot of tips on how to fall asleep better and how to stay asleep. So a sleep promoting environment is the next thing on this chart. And 64% of the people who responded got an A. This is the biggest category of people doing well. I love this because your environment impacts how well you sleep. So have a good sleep promoting environment. Uh, make sure that your sheets are clean. Make sure that your air is clean. Make sure you have some white noise. Now white noise, I don't remember if I covered it in episode 23. It's a little bit nuanced as far as if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Your brain and your stress response do go higher. Your stress response goes higher when you're constantly um exposed to noise, even white noise. In offices where they have white noise going through the intercom all the time, it impacts the worker's stress level and their mental health. So having white noise on in your bedroom might not be great for your stress. However, if it's blocking other sounds and keeping you asleep, then the benefit might outweigh the risk. So you get to you know, be the CEO of your own health and figure out how to promote sleep the best in your environment. All right, the next thing down is avoiding substances before bed. Now, alcohol has been talked about for a very long time of helping people fall asleep, but in actuality, it interrupts your sleep. You Again, like I said, with the blue light, you might be able to fall asleep, but your quality of sleep is not going to be great, and that impacts how well your body can renew its uh, I mean, because when you're sleeping, that's when your body is healing. And you're here on this podcast episode because you have an autoimmune disease. That means that our immune systems are not working well. So of course, if we want to nurture our immune system, and if we want to give it all of the opportunities to do a good job that we absolutely can... We want to set ourselves up for success. So if getting a good night's sleep, getting quality sleep can improve our immune system because our body is spending more time healing, well, I'm all for that. All right, so the next one down is meals at consistent times. People did, actually, it was very even across the board. 29% got an F, 20% got a C, 12% got a B and 39% got an A. So really the breakdown between A and B and C and F is about 50-50. How do you do with meals at consistent times? Now this is important because as we talked about in a previous episode, your blood sugar impacts your immune system and it can be a huge trigger for Hashimoto's. And I talked about that extensively in episode 10. So you can go and take a look at that or take a listen to that episode. All right, so the final category is bright light. 
I talked about this in episode 20, where we were talking about seasonal affect disorder, depression, and hypothyroid, because there's a lot to dive into on that. So episode 20, I do talk to you about the importance of bright light first thing in the morning. All right, so that's a quick summary of this chart on the Sleep in America poll. I just find this so interesting. I love that people are doing a really good job in so many areas, like promoting a good sleep environment, having a consistent wake-up time and a consistent bedtime. There, there are so many good things. And of course, there's always things that we can work on as well. So what are you doing good? And where can you improve? Again, pick just one thing and then pick a simple way to work on it. So like I said, the thing that most people, 76% need to work on the most is electronic devices before bed. If that's it for you, what is one simple action that you can take that will help you to, you know, get better sleep by removing electronic devices before bed. Is it for you setting a bedtime alarm on your phone? Or is it for you engaging the family in like a board game? I know there's some really, really fun board games out there. I have four boys. They range from nine to 15. And every once in a while, we'll play a board game the boys are off screens every Wednesday and Thursday. So the older two, almost every single week, they will ask um, their dad and me to play a board game, especially on Thursday night, because Wednesday night is church. And so we play a lot of Settlers of Catan. Um, they're a big fan of Monopoly, tons of games, and yep, some longer games. But these are good things to build into the routine because they're screenless. And if you turn it into a family culture, it can be a time of bonding, it can be time of chit chat. And if you have teenagers, you know the importance of having time where you're doing something else, but they can bring up topics if they want to talk about. Only you know the first key, the next step of what you can do to promote better sleep. I would love to hear about it. If you're on Instagram, like I said, take a screenshot of this podcast and tag me at Esther Y and let me know either what you're struggling with or what you are going to implement. I'm super excited to hear the responses. I will share them on my stories. So make sure to follow me as well. I will see you back here next week where we will be talking again about how you can improve your health with Hashimoto's. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. Please be sure to discuss any concerns and plans with your trusted healthcare professional.